Hello, and welcome to part two of design of gallium nitride power amplifiers with Dr. Ed Nahinke. I'm Mike Hamilton, your host for this IEEE Microwave Theory and Techniques Society webcast, which is sponsored by Rody and Schwartz. Before we start, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. First, this presentation will be archived. A recording should be posted approximately 24 hours after we finish the presentation. We'll send all registrants an email when the archive webinar goes up so that you can revisit it or share it with your colleagues. Second, we encourage questions. We'll answer them after the talk, but you can submit them at any time during the discussion. Enter your question in the Q&A box in the webcast window, and don't forget to click Submit. Third, some words about the interface. You can enlarge slides by clicking on the rectangle at the top right of the live slide window. You can also enter full screen mode if you desire. Refresh or reload the current web page if you encounter any problems. With regards to audio, if you're listening over your computer speakers, you can adjust the media player volume. You may also need to adjust your system's master volume. Also, the icons at the bottom of the webinar window include a resource list. Clicking that link will start the process to download copies of slides to be presented today. Now let's introduce our speaker. Dr. Ed Nahinke has pioneered the development of state-of-the-art RF microwave and millimeter wave components at Westinghouse and north of Grumman for over 34 years. His circuits include low-noise amplifiers, low-noise oscillators, mixers, and power amplifiers, and the like. He previously worked in cryogenic electronics research at Martin Marietta. He now consults and lectures on linear and nonlinear and wireless transmit and receive circuits and systems. Since 1983, he's lectured to over 3,000 professionals throughout the world. He holds nine patents, one George Westinghouse Innovation Award, and has authored and presented numerous papers on RF microwave and millimeter circuits. Now it's my pleasure to turn the virtual podium over to Dr. Ed Nahinke for part two of a two-part webinar series on the design of gallium nitride power amplifiers. Ed? It's a pleasure to meet, meet with everybody today on the design of gallium nitride power amplifiers part two. In part one, we discussed the gallium nitride properties, the transistor structures, the devices, the foundries, the relative operation of the class A operation. What we're going to do now is we're going to discuss the uh, effects of the power amplifier conduction angle on the power, amp power amplifier currents, power and load, and efficiency. And then we'll look at the power and efficiency of the power amplifier versus conduction angle input power. Then we'll discuss the classes of operation, and we'll talk. To, then we'll have a step-by-step -step design of a class B gallium nitride power amplifier. Then we'll talk about modeling of the gallium nitride power amplifier, and then we'll do a step-by-step -step design of the popular Doherty power amplifier, and then we'll discuss our conclusions. Now here we see here we see the uh, currents as a function of the conduction angle, and what the conduction angle means. Class A is where the current is on all the time. Class B is when it's on half of the time, and Class C when it's on less than half of the time. And Class A B is on the intermediate intermediate between Class A and Class B. Now what what are the what are the uh, Fourier currents? They're the zero to peak value of the of the of the of the current waveform at the various at the various frequencies. So we say we see uh, for class A the zero to peak value of the Fourier component is one half for both class A and class B. And uh, then when we go to class B operation, we can see that the Fourier component is the same as class A, which means you're going to have the same output power, but the current is 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 one over pi compared to one half, so you're going to have much better efficiency. And we can see we have a lot of second harmonic currents, and the third harmonic current is zero, as well as the fourth harmonic current is just a very small value. So to have class B operation, what we want to do is we want to terminate the second harmonic in a short circuit so we only have the fundamental current, fundamental current out, coming out. Now there are some applications where we actually want to create a doubler. So what we do in that situation is we, 
we terminate the fundamental in a short circuit, and we just take the second harmonic current out. And this is a wonderful way to create uh, to create uh, a, a, a second a second harmonic generator. Now let's see what effect let's see what effect the classes of operation have on the performance of the amplifier as for considering the efficiency as well as the output power. So we can see for class A operation, the uh, the power the normalized output power is one and your efficiency is a, is a half. Now as we as we reduce the conduction angle here, we can see for class for class B operation we have we have uh, uh, the same Fourier current at the fundamental for class A or for class B, so you can see the power is going to be exactly the same. And this is really interesting for class A B operation. We actually get more power output coming out of the out of the circuit. Now, if we just don't do anything and allow all the currents to flow in the output. The efficiency is not going to be is is not going to be as high as for it's not going to be as high uh, for class B operation at 78 and a half percent efficiency. Where class B, it's only about 60 percent uh, output. And then we can see for class for class C operation, which is used a lot for or a lot of power output for fixed output power. We can see that the actual power that the actual power is less, but the efficiency is really high. Now, what's very interesting is let's see what effect the uh, the, the performance of the circuit is as we decrease the uh, input power. So we can see if we have if we have class class uh, uh, class A operation here. Let's say we have to decrease the power by 6 dB. So if we have, for example, digital modulation, many times we have to reduce the the uh, average average output power. So if we reduce it by 6 dB, that would be a quarter. We can see our efficiency is only about 13 percent. But now, if we run if we run the operation, say class class uh, AB, 225 degree conduction angle. Now, when we reduce the we reduce the power by 6 dB, our efficiency is 38 percent. So, quite a quite a big improvement. So, you can see uh, operation uh, for class A B operation or B is very important. If we have a digitally modulated signal, where we have to decrease the uh, the decrease the average output power. Now, this is very interesting. We're actually looking now. At the various clop, the clop, various classes of operation on the on the on the uh, on the IV curve for the transistor. So this is class A operation, talking about the current and voltage. This is class B operation here. This is class C operation, and this is the high efficiency modes here, where. We want we want to have when the voltage exists. We don't want to have any current here. So you can see these are the high efficiency classes of operation. Now this is very interesting. This is a class J operation, and for class J operation, this let's follow the trajectory of the current and voltage. So we come along here, and we can come up, and then we come back here on class A, and then we come over and come back. So you can see now with class J operation, actually the voltage is actually higher than V max here. Now let's let's look at class B operation to see what the load line has to be and how how much output power we're going to have. So you can see this is our voltage waveform. So if we take the RMS voltage of the waveform, we get this characteristic here. Now, if we look at the current waveform, it turns out that the, the Fourier component at the fundamental frequency is the same. It's 0.5 compared to class A, so we're going to get the same the same current output here. So the R, R, here's the RMS output current. So we can see that the power is just the voltage swing times the current swing over rate, which is the same for class A. 
And the load resistance here turns out when you go through the mathematics here, what we want to do is we want to increase the load resistance so it's equal to the voltage swing. That's where we'll get the maximum efficiency out of the transistor. And see, A1 is a half, so the voltage swing is just V max minus V min over I max minus I min. So that's what the load resistance has to be. And the efficiency now is pi over 4, 78.5% efficiency. Now let's look at some of the other classes of operation. This is class D operation, and this is used for uh, kilowatts of power when we're below uh, 20 megahertz, and uh, watts of power when we're below a couple gigahertz. And the it's degraded because of the switching characteristics of the transistors. So what happens is this current, this transistor is turned on. So the current comes down here, goes through the load. Then this transistor is turned on, and this one is turned off. So then the, the current comes backwards here and comes through here. So that's, that's class D operation. Now, class E operation invented by Sobel is pretty popular. And what, what with this particular, when you put the parameters in for the transistor and operation, it turns out you may have to have a certain capacitance across the transistor. So say, say for this particular operation, we have to have two picofarads of capacitance. So say the transistor has one, so then we have to add an additional one picofarad capacitance. Now this inductance is slightly higher than the series resonant frequency at the fundamental frequency. So this is the this is the class C operation for uh, use in the Sobel characteristics. Now this is a class F operation, and what we want to do is provide an open circuit for the third harmonic and fifth harmonic and a short circuit of the second and fourth. Now in reality, most of the time, you just worry about the, the second harmonic and the third harmonic. The other harmonics uh, uh, are pretty difficult to achieve, the, the characteristics here. And the inverse class F is when you just do the opposite. You provide an open circuit to the second harmonic and a short circuit at the third harmonic. Now, this class F operation has an advantage if the uh, short is their channel resistance is somewhat higher, this will have better efficiency for inverse class F as opposed to class F operation. Now this is a wonderful operation. This is a push-pull operation. This is where we use two transistors instead of one for the same output power. So if we have to have 10 watts of power, we put 5 watts of power here and 5 watts of power here. Now with this circuit here, with the good balance, there's a virtual short circuit right here. So you can actually put your DC bias right on here without without having any circ circuitry here. And also at the second and fourth harmonic, this looks like a virtual short circuit. So for class B operation, you would just, you're going to have to provide additional circuitry to short out the uh, second harmonic. It's done right here, right in the circuit here. And then this circuit here is used for the uh, for the third for the third harmonic to provide an open circuit for the third harmonic. Now this this is used a lot of times at lower frequencies where the actual turns ratio can be adjusted here to provide your matching circuit. So this really works for this has a very broad band operation. And also also another characteristic is say say the load resistance for the for for this power has to be two ohms. Well, when you divide the power up between the two, it turns out that it can, it's four times the normal value. So if it's if, if for one transistor it's two ohms, when you put this in here, it would be four times two or eight ohms. So what, what that means, it's a lot easier to match the circuit. So this is a very popular circuit. Now let's look at the class J operation here. This is pretty interesting because the uh, the load resistance is R optimal times 1 plus J, and then the second harmonic is minus J3 pi over 8 times R optimal. 
So this is the operation for the, uh, the for the inverse class J, and it's very interesting. Let's let's actually look at uh, let's actually look at a simulation here with the class J operation here, and we can see now that I can actually adjust the alpha in the circuit. So when alpha is equal to zero, this is actually this is the class B operation here, where this this is the this is the voltage, and this is the current here. So you can see there's no power dissipated in this in the for this time here, and then the power is dissipated during here and here. So the, this is where the power is dissipated. Now if we go to class J operation, alpha is equal to one. Now we can see. That this is the this is the trajectory of the circuit here. Comes over here, comes up here, comes over here, and comes over here. So now you can see that there's very little power dissipated in this period of time, but there's more power dissipated in here. And it turns out that theoretical efficiency is the same as the class B operation. Now the inverse class J operation is when alpha is minus. Oh, now I'm sorry. Now here, here we can see this is the load resistance here at the fundamental, and this is the load resistance at the second harmonic. Now if we make alpha equal to minus one, then just the opposite. Now you can see you have very low low dissipated power in here, and now we have the power dissipated during this period of time. And the efficiency is the same as class B. Now here, here the load resistance is going to be capacitive, and the second harmonic is going to be in, uh, inductive. Now what's interesting here, as we change this alpha, we get the same efficiency for for all, for 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 everything. So what's hey, really hey, neat Ed. about this? Yes. Ed, sorry, cool. uh, started to jump in here. There, there is no pointer, so can you use some words to describe what the audience should see here? I, I'm, I'm sorry about that. In, in this oh, you don't see the pointer? Of our operation, there's, well, there's not a pointer for this particular <laughs> for this particular system. It's something that's needed to be addressed for a long time, and ON24 just needs to uh, address it. So the audience is having a hard time seeing what you're talking about, I think, so maybe just use words as much as you can to describe the well, can they see the change the can they see the change of performance oh i understand i understand yeah yeah okay, okay. all right sorry about that I, I apologize for jumping in but thank, thank you okay. okay so what i wanted to what i wanted to say was that um as we change the as we change the alpha value the efficiency remains the same uh, through the whole to the whole characteristics. So what what uh, what you can do is uh, design your fundamental and your second harmonic to follow to follow these paths. So your efficiency will be very high. Your your efficiency will be very high at the various uh, at the various frequencies. Okay now. Now, if we look at the if we look at the various uh, classes of operation, what's very interesting is the peak transistor voltage. And if for for class J operation, the voltage is going to be higher than Vmax, as well as for the class E amplifier and the inverse class F operation. So when you're working with these modes, it's very important to make sure that the that the 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 breakdown voltage is is high enough to support these modes of operation. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to design a 30 watt power amplifier using the uh, Wolf Speed uh, or Cray a gallium nitride power amplifier, high electron mobility transistor. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put a um, a tuner on the circuit on the output of the circuit to adjust for the fundamental and the second and the third harmonic to get the best to get the best output power. Now you notice in the circuit we've actually have to have some 
uh, resistors on the input circuit here, and that's what that re what those resistors there do is that helps the stabilization. So we can put a short circuit at any phase across the input or the output of the circuit, and it won't oscillate. A lot of times, the, man, the, the designers don't worry about this, and everything works great when we put 50 ohms across the input and the output. But when they actually put into the system, we can have filters in there which can provide very high reactance as the other frequency, and the the circuit will oscillate. So we don't want to we want to keep the customers happy. We don't want the circuit to be to oscillate. So now we can see these are. We see the values. We had the values here for the fundamental and for the second harmonic. So what we want to do now is we want to provide a a short circuit at the second harmonic with the reflection coefficient of 141.8 degrees. Now the reason why it's not 180 degrees a short circuit is because the transistor has some output capacitance. So we have to compensate that with it with it with a with a, with an inductive short circuit. So that can be done by putting a by putting a a, a quarter wavelength line that's a short circuit at the sec, at the at the second harmonic and an open circuit at the fundamental and a large capacitance here. So we, what we're going to do is we're going to add a piece of uh, a piece of piece of a transmission line here, uh, 50 ohm line, about 19.1 degrees long, and that will provide the short circuit at the, that will provide the correct impedance now for the, for the, for the second harmonic. Now what we have to do next is we have to provide the proper input impedance here, uh, which is point, point 0.6 at 157 degrees. So we're going to have we're going to have start out with our a blocking capacitor, and then we have the length of line. We have to add a length of line uh, such that when we incorporate this other length of line, it winds up. So it turns out it's about a quarter wavelength line around 22 degrees long, and then this provides uh, this provides the impedance in in cooperation with this with the impedance. Here for this for the second harmonic. Now the next step is to provide the provide the the provide the ma the match for the for the fundamental frequency at the fundamental, and this is this is to provide the gain for the gain provide gain for the transistor. So the impedance is pretty small. So if we try to match this with a low pass matching circuit. That would be like a series a piece of transmission line followed by a shunt capacitance. If we just do it in one step, the Q is going to be very high. But what we're going to do is we're going to do it in two steps here, a series length of line, shunt capacitance, a series length of line, and shunt capacitance. So now the Q is only 1.2. So we can see that that works very nicely. Now if we look down on the bottom, we see the uh, impedance as a function of, of power, and we notice it's changing. And what the reason for that is, some of the some of the elements for the circuit are actually changing. The input capacitance is changing as a function of the input power, and that's due to the nonlinearity of this of the circuitry. So here's the performance of the circuit here. We're getting our 44 dBm of output power with 72% efficiency at the 1 dB gun compression point. Now what we want to do is we want to look at all the parameters of the circuit. So if we look at the top right, we see the current. We see the current, the current as a function of input power. And if we look at the top left, we see that the temperature rise here, it's up. It's 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 very low when the input power is low, and then when we when we increase the power, it goes up to about 35 degrees centigrade above above the heatsink temperature, 
and then it drops down to about 20 degrees at the operation. So this is a wonderful advantage for class for the class B operation compared to class A operation. With class A operation, you have the uh, uh, you have the transistor getting really hot, really hot at the when they don't put any input power, and then it decreases. So generally, what you have to do if we're working with the class A operation, you have to turn the amplifier off when it's not when it's not being used. And here we can see the gain. We can see the gain and phase as a function of the input power on the top left hand on the bottom left hand circuit. So we can see we have about 0.15 degree drop in in gain and then it comes up to about one degree and then drops down to minus one degree. And you can see the phase is varying too. Now on the bottom right, you can actually see that the the second harmonic is about 40, 40 dB down and the, set, the third harmonic is about 30 dB down. So this compares, so we can see now that the, um, the uh, the, pow the the efficiency is much better for class B operation, but the, the, the gain is down 2 dB. So that's that's characteristics of the of the class B operation. Your gain's not as is be not not as going to be as high, because half of the time the the, the transistor turned off, and we can see we get a little bit reduction of power for the circuit here. Now, the gain, the gain compression uh, for the gallium nitride transistors, transistors are not quite as sharp as the as the PHEMP devices, uh, with the difference in the saturated power compared to the P1dB is only for PHEMP devices. It's only about one or one or two dB, but it can be a lot more for the for the gallium nitride transistors, and the AM to PM for power amplifiers is that the variation is caused by the uh, nonlinear parameters changing as a function of the input power. And we can actually see that when we looked at the uh, at the input impedance as a function of power, you can see it's varying due to the due to the due to the, uh, due to the changes. Now this is pretty interesting. How can we actually work these transistors with a digitally modulated signal? And what we have to consider is the peak to average value for the for the transistors. Now for QPSK, the peak to average is only about 3.7 dB, or for QAM 64 QAM, it's about 6 dB. And a lot of the a lot of the newer modulations are like uh, where we have much higher than Q64 QAM. We're going to get much larger variations of the peak to average, maybe about 9 dB or so, like for the for the 5G. So what's important here is here's the rule of thumb. If you don't have any pre-distortion uh, that's existing and you want to have the, uh, the adjacent channel power down by 40 dB and the, and the error vector magnitude uh, less than a couple degrees, then you have to adjust the circuit so that the peak signal is at approximately at the P1 dB. And so you actually have to back off the power uh, for the average power, and your your efficiency then is going to be is going to be decreased. So now this is this is this is where I adjusted the the same amplifier to have a, a adjacent channel power down by 40 dB with an error vector magnitude of two to three degrees, which will meet the system performance for most any type of operation. So if we compare them, we can see that the Class B amplifier has about twice better power efficiency compared to Class A, a much lower junction temperature, but the power is reduced 2 dB due to the AM to PM conversion. Now let's what we're going to talk next about. We're going to talk about modeling of of the of the transistors. And you have to consider the trapping effects and with the associated current knee collapse. If you have trapping effects when you're trying to work the transistor at low 
at low voltages, uh, the, the, the current, the current de de decreases, the trapping effects. And you also have to make sure that the model actually is going to be working when the transistor's uh, below the low threshold where the transistor's turned off, where you have to have a good model for the transistor. And also, an electrothermal model is very important to consider the effect of the temperature on the performance of the, of the transistor models. And also, you should have to use pulsed IV characteristics for, for modeling of the transistor. Now, we can actually see what the difference between the, uh, the regular IV curves and the pulsed IV curves. The pulsed IV curves are solid lines where the the uh, the, uh, the the normal thing when when you run run it all the with all heating up the transistor all the time, it's the ones with the dots on there. So you can see we get much much differences between the the IV curves, which is important in the modeling. And also you can see the effect of the gain. Uh, the gain is uh, a solid line. Is with the uh, is with the pulsed I this is with the normal uh, IV curves. With the pulsed IV curves, you can see the gain is a lot higher. Now, when we model the transistor, you have to do a lot of different different things to get the correct performance of the circuit with the model. You have to look at the small signal models to to get some of the parameters of the circuit the large signal models also, and then you have to look at the IV curves, uh, IV curves of, the, of the transistor to get the proper performance of the circuit. So you can see now here, uh, this is typically what's done then. You can use a, a, a circuit, circuitry here to extract the, some of the parameters of the circuit. And then you also want to do a load pull on the actual circuit to check the performance of the circuit. And you have to use the correct model for the transistor. And also you want to use the pulsed IV curves. And, and then you have to go through this and then get the correct performance of, of the model. Now here we want to make sure that we use an electrothermal model not all the not all the models use electro electrothermal models. So a lot of one of the popular models is the Angelo uh, gallium nitride model, as well as the Cray, the model figure stats model, which has the the proper the proper characteristics to get the performance. So you can see this is the Cray the, the this is the Cray model here in ADS here where the models, the transistor characteristics are put in this model right here. And that, that gives very good, very good performance. And this is the, uh, this is the gallium nitride Angelo model here, where you can see the various, various parameters that we have the circuit. And this, this here is very nice. Uh, at the bottom, at the bottom right, we see the source, and we see this parallel RC circuit. And that can that can actually predict the performance of the model as a function of time. If you have a pulse a pulse characteristics where the transistor is on for a certain period of time and it's off, so you can actually model the temperature of the transistor as a function of the time uh, time period for the transistor. Now. The next, the next thing we want to look at is the design of a Doherty gallium nitride power amplifier. Now, why is this so important? It turns out that that uh, ideally the the Doherty amplifier, when you back off the amplifier by 6 dB, it has the same efficiency as when it's when it's not backed off. So, and then the efficiency is a little higher during the period from full full output power to 6 dB, and this is great if we have a 64 qAm signal where where you're going to get very good efficiency over that whole period of time. So your efficiency is really going to be super for that. And another neat thing about the gallium about the Doherty amplifier is. Uh, 
it actually adjusts the adjusts the load line when you're not when the power decreases it raises the load line so you get more of a voltage swing which is that's how the efficiency is improved for that circuit so what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, a 10 watt power amplifier using 50 volt uh, source to drain voltage with about 100 milliamps of, of current so it's in deep class AB we want to work it from 3.4 to 3.8 gigahertz and the design objective is to get these characteristics of the circuit here at the at the at the one and a half dB gain compression point. So the first thing we want to do is we want to adjust the uh, put it put it we want to adjust put 50 volts and we want to adjust the uh, we want to adjust the uh, adjust the circuit for about 100 milliamps of, of DC current. So that's the that's the first step is to bias the transistor. So this requires about minus 1.3 volts on the gate. So that's the first step of the operation. Now the second step of the operation is to do a load pull on the circuitry here, and we see that we get the uh, this is the impedance here on the left hand side to get the proper the proper impedance at the fundamental frequency. And that's pretty easily accomplished by a low impedance uh, a little bit higher than a quarter wavelength line. So we just have to have it about 100, 100 degrees long instead of 90 degrees long, and 21 ohms, 21 ohms quarter wavelength line. So now this this then adjusts the this then adjusts the uh, the impedance at the fundamental frequency. And now the trick is to get the input impedance matched and also to have it stable. This transistor is very, very unstable versus frequency, so it, it requires a, a lot of adjustments here to get, the, uh, to get the input matched as well as to get it stable here. So we're adding a series and a parallel resistance on the input circuit here. And then we have a, a little length of line we adjust on the front, as well as our capacitance. Our series capacitance is actually used to match the circuit. And um, now to get the to get the the circuit matched uh, for stability, we actually have to make instead of making the lines 90 degrees long, they're adjusted actually 80 degrees long. And at different frequencies here, so on the both both on the bias circuitry uh, on the input and the output, and then with that combination, we can now get the circuit matched as well as stable. So here you can see on the left hand chart, this is the stability planes here, and um, about two tenths of a gigahertz. It's Slightly, it's coming in slightly, so we have to do that with the larger capacitance on the output circuit. And you can see it's double tuned circuit on the input from 3.4 to 3.7. It's, it's very well matched on the input circuit here. So this is the performance of the circuit now. Uh, at the one and a half dB gain compression point. We have about 82% efficiency with 42, 42 dBm of output power, and the input match is, is uh, 18, 18 dBm down. Now, to, now we have to design the Doherty amplifier. Now that's done. The first step is we want to we want to use a 90 degree. Uh, a, a, in, when the, we want to create a, a coupler that gives 90 degrees difference between the two circuitry. And then we have to add a 90 degree line on the one circuit compared to the other circuit to get both of the signals in phase. Now what's very important when we turn the when we when we when we reduce the power by 60 B, we have to turn off the auxiliary amplifier and we want the impedance to look very high. That's why we have that phase shift phi on both there, and that's that's used to uh, provide. So when the transistor's turned off, 
the uh, this the auxiliary amplifier looks like an open circuit. So that's very important. So that's that's the that's the that's the step there. So that how that's done is we have to add about a, a 43 degree long 50 ohm line on there to make sure that it looks like an open looks like a very high impedance then. So that takes care of that. And now this is the this is the balanced amplifier where where we just put two uh, 90 degree couplers on the input and the output. So this is for comparison. And now this shows the this shows the performance of the circuit here uh, for for the normal operation, and then this is a Doherty amplifier right here. So I'd like now to go to the screen share mode here, where we can actually see how that works. So here, in this particular situation, we can see both the the Doherty amplifier and the Class A operation. They have the same the same performance when the transistors are biased equally. Now what we're going to do is we're going to now adjust the gate adjust the gate voltage on the second auxiliary amplifier so that it's turned off when the power is down by 6 dB. So now what we're going to do is we're going to adjust the we're going to adjust the uh the auxiliary amplifier here so that so that so that so then the uh, the amplifier down is uh is operational for some reason this so you can see the efficiency is fifty five percent uh when it's backed off instead of the the forty five percent efficiency. So let's let's talk about our conclusions now. Uh, the power amplifier parameters for varying conduction angle provides a designer insight to the uh, amp amplifier for the different conditions. And now we we talk, talked about the different classes of operation provide the optimal choices for the for the design parameters. And the modeling of the, ga the gallium nitride power amplifier is very important in order to get good agreement between the actual measurements and the design parameters. And we did a step-by-step -step design for a class B operation. And then we 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 looked at the uh, the different constellations for the different analysis. And we did a step-by-step -step of the Doherty power amplifier, which is shown, which is, which is, which is, which is what we have. So anyway, the design of the, of the, uh, Gallium nitride power amplifier is very is very interesting because it provides really really high output power with with excellent efficiency. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Great, thanks, Ed. Um, so just one one quick uh, comment here. Did, did the I know there was some things you wanted to do screen sharing for. Was that not functioning? We didn't. Didn't see that happen. Oh, didn't they? Didn't they see the last one? I I don't. I, it, it didn't come up for me. I'm not sure if it. Uh, oh, okay. If it did or. Um, okay, and also, uh, so there there are there is some time for questions here. Um, we currently don't have have any, so if you have any questions for this, uh, please uh, please ask away. Yes. 
seems like we might be having some <clears throat> some technical difficulties here. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks for sending these questions in. So, uh, Ed, uh, maybe this is a question you can help with. Um, sure. Let's see. Any comments about loss uh, loss in the input when uh, resistive stabilization is used? Uh, questions about what was the first part of the question? So it comments essentially about loss when you use resistive stabilization. Oh, yes. Use yes. Um, the, the, the resistive stabilization will definitely affect the gain, okay? Now, one of the techniques that can be used uh, for resistive stabilization is on the input to put a parallel resistor with a capacitor, and the capacitor went on to be series resonant at the fundamental frequency. So a lot of times, your capa if, 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 if the capacitor can have some inductance to it, so if you have to add a little bit more inductance, you would actually have to add a little piece of transmission line in series with the capacitor, and that would be right across the re right across the resistance. So the idea there is at the fundamental frequency, the signal is going not going to be going through the resistor, but it's going to be going through the series R the series LC circuit here, which is going to be resonant at the fundamental frequency. So in this situation, there's not going to be any loss. Uh, there's not going to be any loss of gain. So that's one of the techniques that can be used. It's very popular. That can be used to affect the uh, to affect uh, make sure the, the circuit is stable, but it doesn't reduce doesn't affect the reduction of gain. Okay. We have, have a couple more questions here, but there's still uh, still time for folks to submit their questions. Please, uh, please feel free to do that if you have questions. Uh, here's one on uh, any comment on gate switched bias design for radar. Yes, uh, for radar, uh, for radar, a lot of times the uh, the when we work with the radar. Generally, you want to work with the power added efficiency is the highest. So, uh, so um, what the, a lot of times the transistor is turned off. The transistor is turned off when you're not when you're not transmitting, and it's turned on when you're transmitting. So that's one of the techniques uh, that that can be used uh, for. Uh, for turning on and off the transistor. Okay. Uh, this is maybe more on the technology side, but any comments on what is the best backside metallization for gallium nitride devices? <laughs> Not necessarily a PA design question, backside, but uh, any... Backside metallization. Well, for 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 the for the gallium nitride high power transistor, you generally want to solder it solder it down. So the backside metallization would would have to be something that would be compatible with with soldering. Um, you really don't want to uh, you don't want to use you don't want to use epoxy to 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 connect the transistor to the heat plate. Um, because uh, uh, it has a higher, a higher, a higher delta T across it, so the, the backside metallization would have to be compatible with the solder that you're using. Yeah, it's de definitely more of a packaging question, but uh, still quite relevant to get the the power and heat out of these devices. Okay, oh, for, uh, for... any? Go ahead. Go ahead. Ed. For, well, um, when you put the transistor down, 
uh, you have to consider the uh, the delta, the, the 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 change of the the distance as a function of temperature. Uh, if you put, you have to consider the thermal expansion characteristics between the transistor and between the transistor and what you're putting it down on. So they usually they put it down on poly 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 molly. Or there's a new there's a new device that has that has um, diamond in it, which which uh, you can actually purchase these things from manufacturers a diamond heat sink. It's it's diamond with another material, and that has the characteristics that it it does it has similar ther thermal expansion characteristics with the gallium nitride. So that's very important that when you when you put the circuit down, you have to consider the thermal effects. So you you don't want you don't want the transistor to be popping off the the heat plate when you when you temp temperature cycle it. Absolutely important. Okay, uh, well, so we haven't had any additional questions uh, in the last few minutes, so I think we can go ahead and and wrap that up now. Um, as we said earlier, this session will be archived on the Society website at mtt.org, and all registrants will get an email reminder with the website address when that's available. For attendees who would like to receive uh, PDH credits, please follow the link in the webcast view and use the code that's provided on the last slide of this presentation, which is being shown uh, right now. Um, as noted previously, this was part two of a two-part webinar series, so please find and watch part one that's located on the MTTS website at mtt.org. And once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Nahinki for this excellent and informative presentation. We also thank our sponsor for today, Rody and Schwartz, for their generous support of this webinar. Special thanks also to our audience for joining us today. We hope you found today's event valuable and that you return for future IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcasts. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks, Ed. You're welcome.